our second to last talk on this track for today. Uh, our presenter is uh, Peter Thiemann. He's professor for computer science at the University of Freiburg. Um, he's there, there he's head of the programming language research department, or research group. Mm -hmm. um, he's currently researching static and dynamic analysis of JavaScript. And today he's going to give us a presentation on session types. Yeah, yeah. see you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so of course this should be extended by saying I'm also interested in types for uh, protocols. Um, well, let's go. Um, as you've already gathered, if you followed the talks in, in the morning, um, types seem to be a tr predominant uh, topic in the functional programming community. And indeed, types are a success story for, well, um, soon it will be almost a decade, so since Church's ideas from 1940. And um, Kathleen in the morning was talking about um, formal methods, uh, and she was rightfully saying that types are the most frequently used formal method. And originally it's been um, invented to describe successful computations, so that was the idea that, that Church had back then. And uh, nowadays it's mostly used to prevent certain runtime um, errors. So, and um, um, I would like to make a little distinction between the traditional way that types are used and the one that, it's, uh, that they're going to be used for, uh, for protocols. Um, so traditional types give a certain kind of guarantee, and the guarantee is really that no type errors occur. Okay, what's a type error, type mismatch? Um, so you really want to avoid that data is being misinterpreted. Now, for example, typically in, in, in the computer, you, uh, every data type is represented by some bit pattern, and depending on whether it's intended as a floating point number or an integer, it makes a lot of a difference. Uh, and everyone who's programmed in C and, uh, and used unions uh, knows about that. Yeah? So therefore, in order to avoid this misinterpretation, float and int should be really distinct types. Yeah? And moreover, the bit pattern intended as an integer shouldn't be used as uh, the address of a string or a function and so on. Yeah? So strings and integers should also be distinct types. And the type system's job is to avoid this kind of confusion. And this kind of type system is really super well researched because this is something that happened like at the beginning. And it's also being put into practice by lots of statically typed um, programming languages. And um, as you know, it eliminates a whole class of errors. Yeah, so that's the nice thing about such a lightweight um, formal method like type systems. You, have, uh, you nail down to a certain kind of error and then you eliminate um, any occurrence of this class of errors. In this case, misinterpretation of data. Uh, the typical thing that happens, and here is, is just something that I, that I um, pulled out. Um, typically, you have types like int and bool. Then maybe you have uh, pair types. You have some types, lists maybe. You have record types, variant types, and function types. Um, and then uh, you have a type system that says, OK, 42, that happens to be an int. Or true is a bool or some, uh, some floating point constant uh, uh, is a float, or you have a pair two and one, which, is, uh, which has type a bool um, cross one. All right. But, of course, your pro uh, our programs have more errors than just that. Yeah? So there's more things that can go wrong than just misinterpreting uh, data. Um, and uh, you May, may think of um, wanting to track additional properties of values. Yeah? And typically, additional properties would be that you have refined types. So instead of speaking of the entire integers as a type, you would say, OK, I want to narrow this down to a certain subset. Maybe I just want to talk about the type of prime numbers or something like that, yeah? or some, some subsets of uh, strings. Or you might want to talk about um, data integrity and confidentiality. Um, so you might um, want to add security features to the type system. Or you might want to add units of measure. Yeah? And all that doesn't really um, um, change the flavor of, of properties. So basically, um, maybe except for the security ones, so you really want to avoid misinterpretations of data types. You want, in the first case, you want to narrow down your domains of your functions so that they only work in, on the domain that they're intended on. 
But then we, you, um, uh, we might be after an entirely different class of errors. No? And um, uh, that kind of errors is, is not really uh, tied to certain values, but it's tied to behaviors. Yeah, so um, so um, what I'm talking about here in, in the context of protocols is I'm, I'm, I'm also, of course, interested in not interpreting bit patterns wrongly, but I'm much more interested in um, having this, the right sequence of actions happen. Yeah, so I would like to track behaviors, and that's what leads, what leads to so-called behavioral types. And the, the underlying idea somehow, of the, the meme, if you want to say it like that, is um, that we're talking about values or rather objects that have a state and this state can change over time and the changes happen in response to some kind of stimuli. Usually these are like operations, um, but uh, I mean you could have uh, objects that work differently. Now, so it's not just a property of values, but we're after um, some property that, that changes over time, that is attached to, to some stateful um, thing. One, oh, so somehow it killed the colors that are, so there are supposed to be colors on the slide, but they are somehow removed by the, by the beamer. Um, so the prototypical example of that is, um, is the one um, where you are considering a file um, API. So here I've, uh, I'm probably misusing uh, OCaml syntax to state the API of a file. So you have an abstract type of file handles. You have um, operations to open the file, write to it, and close the file. Uh, and the idea is if you, uh, if you open the file, you get a handle. The handle is ready, in this case, just for writing stuff to it. Um, then you can um, um, use the write operation arbitrarily many times on that handle. Finally, you close the handle using the close operation, but then you still have this this handle around. Yeah? And down here is, is the shortest, well, almost shortest uh, code fragment I could write. So you open foo, you write something to it, you close it, but then in the next line, I'm trying to write again. And with the usual type systems that are just value oriented, um, at this point you get a runtime error. Yeah? This handle was closed, trying to write to a closed file or whatever. Yeah, and the idea of a behavioral type system is to actually track this kind of state of the handle um, and turn this into a um, compile time error. Um, and here I'm giving you a slightly simplistic solution. Um, one simple solution would be to augment this, uh, this type system by adding, um, um, by, by adding, adding the facility to make types linear. Um, in this case here, what I'm saying is, uh, so the first line here says type t colon lin, it says, all right, the type of file handles is now linear. So that means I'm now not allowed to discard a file handle, um, meaning to just let it disappear without closing the file, and I'm also not uh, allowed to duplicate the file handle. Uh, so that's the only change, really. So the rest of the interface still looks the same, but uh, we have in mind still that uh, this T is, um, is really linear. Um, so um, what happens now? Um, ah, sorry, I needed to, uh, in order to do that, I need to change the type of write um, uh, in a subtle way. Namely, the write cannot just um, um, uh, perform an effect on the, on the file handle, but it sort of has to return the modified file handle. Uh, so right now it takes a file handle, writes a string to it, and then it returns um, a new incarnation of the file handle. So this is because um, the file handle type is linear, so write consumes it, but then in order that the rest of the code can do something with it, it returns a new incarnation. Uh, so the new file handle after uh, writing this piece. So the close function, um, finally consumes the file handle. Yeah? So it has the magic uh, stuff internally that, that is able to digest the file handle and, and, and ter close it and finalize it. So now if I try to write the same um, code as before, um, I'm getting a type error. Yeah? So here I'm opening the file, I'm getting F1. So F1 is the file handle, but I can only use it once. Okay, so I'm writing something to F1 and in return I get a new incarnation of the file handle. All right, so that I can use that once again to close the file, but then it's no longer available in the last line, and 
a type checker that is, a, that is aware of linearity would tell you this is a type error. Uh, so you can't use it again because it's a linear resource. All right. So this is also not really a new idea. Yeah? So, the, so the, the main idea of this uh, linear typing, linear type systems, is that every variable of linear type, so sometimes you have a mixture, as you may have seen in um, uh, Edwin's talk. Um, this is not nice. Uh -huh. um, every variable of such a type must be used exactly once. Uh -huh. No throwaway, no duplication. It's rooted in something called linear logic, which has been invented by the logician uh, Jean-Yves uh, Girard in 1987. And it has found many uses in memory management and, and resource control. Uh, and it's also very useful in, in, our, in the subject that we're going to get to. Uh, so now we're getting to the, to the core topic, namely session types, um, which essentially use all of <laughs> what I've told you up to now. So what's a session type? So session types are um, types, in, in some sense behavioral types, um, which um, govern structu structured bidirectional communication. And I will explain every bit of that in, a couple of, in the next couple of minutes. So the idea is that session types uh, prescribe the, uh, the values transmitted, and that leads to sort of classical type safety. Now, so if uh, A sends a float to B, then B should interpret that as a float and not as an integer. Yeah, so that's sort of the classical part. But then it also prescribes the direction and the sequencing of the transmissions. Yeah, and that's something new because that's the behavior that um, evolves over time. And um, this property is called session fidelity. Yeah, because, well, as we will see, if both communication partners share the same ch uh, session type um, of the channel that they're where, where they are connected, then if both are um, adhering to the, to the structure of the session, then no errors can happen. Now, so, so in some sense, session types codify the structure of communication and by that make it available to um, a reasoning and programming tools. Now, so once the structure is there in, in the type, then actually, as you will see, the structure of the code follows the structure of the type um, quite a lot. Just a little history, so session types are not new either. So they were born like more than 25 years ago. Originally they were, s they were stated for a concurrency calculus, the pi calculus. Um, and here I'm just listing a couple of uh, seminal papers. So it really, um, pretty much the idea goes back to Kohei Honda um, uh, in a 1993 paper. Um, uh, and and all the, uh, all the um, the original papers um, really built on the pi calculus. As um, pi calculus is not so accessible for many people, let's put it mildly, um, <laughs> this presentation is influenced by a functional presentation by Simon Gay and, and Vasco Vasconcelos. Um, and uh, right, so in, in that framework, um, a type looks like that. So so this is a session type for a server, and this is sort of a standard example in that community. So it's a, it's a server that can, that can perform some simple mathematical operations. Um, and essentially, uh, first of all, we run into this uh, uh, strange symbol, into this strange type constructor, which essentially indicates an external choice. So that means at that point, the server awaits a command. No? So it's in some sense, this, this, this ampersand means I'm awaiting a command, and depending on the command, I'm doing different things. So the commands are neg and add and quit. And depending on what it gets, it continues like this, like that, or like that. Then the question marks um, indicate um, receiving operations, and the, the exclamation points uh, indicate uh, send operations. So here, if the server receives the command neg, then it expects an integer, and it will send an integer in return. And then it will recurse to the same server type again. Uh, similarly, for the add, it receives two integers, sends an integer, and uh, recurses. And for quit, um, end means, well, the only thing you can do with this uh, channel is to close it. So you finish the, 
the communication. So now you might ask, um, and, and uh, as we will see, um, we will program the server against this type, and essentially the communication structure of the server, um, uh, the, the way the communication operations are lined up in the server follows this type exactly. So now you might wonder what a um, uh, client looks like, and the, the client type looks pretty much the same if you squint, um, but essentially all the sending operations are exchanged by their corresponding receiving operations. Yeah, so here you see that easily. Yeah, so here in this case we're receiving an int uh, and then, sorry, <coughs> we're sending an int and then receiving one, sending two ints and then receiving one. The only new thing or maybe unfamiliar thing is this uh, open plus and that um, indicates an internal choice. So at that point the client can make a choice and the client can send one of the commands. Yeah, so, yeah, so if I'm implementing the client, I can choose whether I want to do a, a mac or add, or if I want to, to quit the whole thing and, and finish up. Yeah, so here, the, the, so this internal choice means send the command to the server, so the server sees it as, as an external choice and, and branches on that, and the client has to branch accordingly. So this is a, a concept that is uh, um, pervasive in, in session types. It's called duality. And in fact, the client type is the dual of the server type. Uh, and duality in this simple case just means you, you swap the direction of all the communications. Right, so this is essentially what we've seen so far. Uh, so a session type can either be such an external choice where you have several commands, and for each command you can continue in a certain way. Then there's an internal choice, which is just the corresponding sending operation, and then there is uh, a receive operation, input something of type T, and continuous S, and, and uh, the uh, dual output operation. And end marks the end, and then the functional fragment has essentially the same types as before. Uh, so you've seen an, a number of dots in the um, here in the syntax that just means sequencing and uh, um, I'm going to talk about neck and add and quit as uh, choice labels and the idea is that they are different. So inside of a single uh, choice, uh, choice type they just have to be different so that I can tell them apart. Well now we should maybe look at an implementation so this is just the same server type um, repeat it. And let's have a look at the code. So the code really looks like uh, like this. So firstly, well I should have a pointer but I don't. Um, so firstly in the server type we have the <laughs> we have the external choice. So we need an operation that receives the command and then branches on the command. So that's what this R case in the first line is doing. And, and apart from the specialty that it receives the command, it behaves just like a case. No? So we have alternatives for add, neck, add, and quit is probably below the, below the line here. And um, then um, an important thing, as we will maybe see directly on the next slide here. So this is just the same code on, this, on, on a larger scale. So firstly, here we're starting with the server type. Then we are doing the, um, uh, then we are receiving the command, and now here we are rebinding C. Yeah? So the the case also consumes the C, which is also linear, yeah? because once I'm inside of the branch, now C needs to have a different type. Yeah? Outside the, the the top level C here. That's the whole server thing. It's an external choice of different commands and so on. But once I've seen the command, then I'm ca I can narrow it down. So here, in this branch, C has really this type. And after I'm receiving the first um, the first value, then um, then I need to peel off this type. Yeah, so I'm just left with a type where I can uh, send something and then need to recurse to the server. So after sending, then C has the server type, which means I can recursively invoke the server again. Yeah. So because the, uh, the, the the channel endpoint, which is this C here, changes state whenever I do an operation on it, 
also its type changes, and uh, I need to use it linearly because otherwise I could, uh, well, after after receiving the command here, I could try to receive another command on the same line, which doesn't make sense. Yeah, and for add the code is pretty much the same, and the progression is also the same. Right. So here is the client. So the client looks a bit simpler, and I will explain in some detail in a, in, a, in, a, in a couple of minutes why that's the case. So for the client, actually, um, um, we now have an, we have an internal choice. So the client can choose whether it wants to add or negate or just quit the thing. So what it does is, <laughs> what it does is, it selects just the negation and doesn't really exercise the other options. Yeah, so it just does that, which means it should send one uh, one argument for the negation for the neg and then receive the answer, and then the the D here after <coughs> after processing the branch for neg, we are again in the in the client. So the, the D channel has type client again, and uh, then we can select quit and uh, finalize. Uh, I should have written close there, so and that's not really necessary in this case. Now, so as you see, from the type um, of the server, you can more or less immediately generate at least the communication fragment of the code. Uh, so that's uh, what I mean with uh, accessible to, um, to tooling. Well, so next part is how do we actually um, get a connection? Yeah? So right now I've just talked about, okay, there's a client and there's a server, and they, they kind of live separately. We also need to somehow connect them together. And one concept that's used in, in session types is that of a port. So here I'm declaring a port of type um, hash server, that's P here. And then there are, there are two operations, um, accept and request. And um, um, the, the uh, uh, accept and request, they both refer to the same port. And what happens is that um, the two threads, uh, so there's a, a parallel sign in between. So this is one thread and this is a second thread. So they, the, the two run in parallel, but accept and request uh, both block until they find a partner that wants to communicate on the same port. Uh, at that point, um, um, the accept, so if, if they actually um, uh, synchronize, then the, uh, the S becomes um, the endpoint of a communication link to, to C here, and uh, S and C have um, dual types. So S will have this, the, the server type, and C will have the dual type of server, which happens to be client, and then our server and neck client can go to work and can exchange their, their messages. All right. So what are the key points so far? Um, well, firstly, the session endpoints are, are linear. Huh? So each of the endpoints occurs exactly once in the system. Why is that? Well, each endpoint has a certain state. It points to a certain point in the protocol. And once I'm doing the corresponding operation, then I'm advancing inside of the protocol. Yeah. So therefore, the old, the, 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 the previously typed reference to the channel isn't valid anymore, and I need to use a, a new one. As we've seen, the session types change with each communication. Um, the structure of the code matches pretty much uh, exactly the structure of the session types. And moreover, I didn't demonstrate that here, but we will see examples of that. Um, sessions are higher order, which means that we can also transmit session endpoints. Okay, so now I've um, I've collected a couple of phenomena, and depending on the on the time available, I will visit some or more of them. Um, so let's first go uh, to number one, which is deadlocks. So I apologize for the lot of code on the slide, but this is like the shortest I could come up with to produce a deadlock here. Um, it would be nice if session type systems would prevent deadlocks. Unfortunately, the simple-minded ones don't. Um, if you want to prevent deadlocks, you need to invest a little bit more um, work. I'll come to that in a minute. 
So here this is a, a very simple way to, to make a deadlock. So essentially what I'm doing is here I have two, well, why did I use different ports? That wouldn't be necessary. So, so I have two ports and I create two connections. Yeah, so here I'm making a connection on port one, accept and request, and another one on port two, accept and request. And then here I'm first sending on S1 and then on S2, and here I'm receiving in the other way around. Yeah, so the classical uh, stupid uh, synchronization error. So um, this, these two threads, these two um, uh, processes get stuck at this point yeah, because this sender doesn't have a, uh, a corresponding receiver and this receiver doesn't have a corresponding set. Yeah, so um, uh, it deadlocks because we have synchronous uh, send and uh, send operations. If it were asynchronous, then this code would actually would actually um, would actually work, no, but um, okay. Well, so if we had asynchrony, we're not really much better because we could have a, a higher order process. So higher order means um, so here we have one port that just sends uh, something of this simple session type, where I'm just sending an integer and then quit. But the other part has a more interesting type, so it receives a um, it receives a channel endpoint of of this session type, and then quits. Uh, so I'm transmitting an entire um, channel. So what does that look like? So first, here I'm creating the connection on on port one and on port two, and then down here I'm sending um, I'm sending the I'm sending on C1, that's this guy here, um, the channel end for C2, which is this guy here. Well, and now the annoying thing is that after this receive operation here, um, um, I have both ends of the P2 channel in this process. Now, so now I have, uh, I have um, um, C2, which is the receiving end, of the process number of the of the channel number two, and I also have the sending end of the same channel, and now it's just a matter of uh, uh, first trying to receive on this channel uh, and, and and to to get it that one. Now, so so you can see, and this is a standard feature. So you, so there are higher order sessions. You can send the channel end over another channel, and the first process is going to be stuck at this position here at this receive operation. Um, even if the sending is synchronous, yeah, so the second process will actually um, will actually terminate nicely, but the first process remains stuck. Okay, so in general, that's uh, that's the point. So in general, the the, the session types do not pull out deadlocks, um, but uh, there are actually uh, there are versions that that do that, um, and essentially they are based on things that uh, that you're familiar with from deadlock detection. So they're they're based on cycle detection. Um, and uh, which gets pretty hairy uh, in, in, in the presence of these higher order features. Um, or what you can also do is you can restrict um, the way that channels are created and you can link it with uh, the creation of sessions and in that case you can also build um, systems where, um, where deadlocks are really topologically impossible right? because you always have separate regions um, I mean, essentially, the, the problem in, in, in the second uh, case was that there was one process that had both ends of the same channel. So, we, so the sending and the receiving end. And then it's easy to, to get into, the, into a deadlock. And uh, using the right um, <coughs> topological constraints, you can avoid that um, altogether at some loss of explicitity. All right, so let's talk about this. Um, so you may have wondered already, we had this elaborate code for implementing the server type, but then we had the client type that only used one particular line in the, in, 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 in the protocol. Yeah, so the server was ready to deal with all kinds of commands, but then the client would only say, okay, I'm just using the, neg the, the, the next command, and then I'm going to quit. Yeah. So. Uh, um, nevertheless, um, the, the, the type 
presumably the type of the channel that the client was using was also client, which is also a recursive type. So the magic um, answer to that is that we have used subtyping at that point. And uh, subtyping uh, here is uh, using the sort of gold standard, which is Liskov substitution principle, which says that if S is a subtype of T, then it's safe to use a value of the subtype S whenever a value of type T is expected. And in our case, the object that we are looking at are the, the channels. So um, if I have a channel of a subtype, um, then I can also use it as a, at, um, at a supertype. So that means, in our case, the implementation doesn't have to match the, the type of the port exactly. Yeah, but depending on whether we are looking at the client or the channel, it can either be a supertype or a subtype. Yeah, so it can implement the supertype, um, which means the point type is more restricted. And in session types, there are two sources of subtyping or subsumption, namely the choices. Yeah, so if I have an external choice, if I have a session, a session uh, endpoint of this external choice point, then I can use that even if I have code that can deal with more choices. Uh, so if I, if I, um, um, we were talking about a server with three commands. If I write code that can also process a multiplication command, then it's fine to use it with the add and neck, uh, because it can certainly deal with add, neck, and quit. In addition, it can deal with multiplication, but nobody is ever asking. Um, dually, for the internal choice, um, if I have a session that on which I can choose between behaviors L1 to Ln, then I can also use it with any subset. Uh, I'm just going to ignore the other capabilities of the, of the channel. Uh, and that's exactly what happened for the client. Uh, so the client was offered, you can do addition, negation, or quit. And the client says, oh, I'll only do negation. Well, it, it, I don't care what the rest um, about the remaining things. Now, so this was the, the this is the full client uh, client type, now, so which is uh, derived as the dual of the server type. So the actual code doesn't use the add choice, but it rather looks like, yeah, it, it only uses neck and and quit. Now, so I could remove the add, um, which is okay. Yeah, which is according to what we just saw, it's a it's a super type. Or we could even use this type, which is completely aligned with the code. Yeah, so because first we select neck, then we send an integer, receive an integer, and then we select quit. Yeah. And, and this type, so these type are all in, so client 2 is the super type of client 1, which is the super type of, uh, of client. Um, so I hope this, this uh, argumentation is um, reasonably intuitive. Uh, to pin it down formally is um, a little bit more involved, and I won't go into that here. Yeah, but it makes it quite um, quite flexible. So there are more sources of subtyping, which are more or less the usual ones. Um, if you say that integers are a subtype of long, then you can send an integer if a long is expected and so on. But in the interest of time, I will go over that um, more quickly. Uh, uh, another one that's really interesting and that has spurred some recent um, research is uh, asynchrony. So, uh, so far, our implicit assumption, uh, I hope, was that mostly this, uh, the communication was um, synchronous, but session types can also be used for asynchronous communication. Right? In fact, it's, it's sound. Huh? So if I just use it as uh, I showed you, um, everything is sound. But on top of that, asynchrony gives you some more, um, some new um, possibilities for subtyping. Huh? So essentially, when you have uh, asynchronous communication, then s uh, a sender can keep on sending yeah, until the buffer is full, or until, if you have an infinite buffer, it can keep on sending immediately, yeah, even if the receiver isn't catching up immediately. And that can also be used to um, define uh, subtyping, like, like here. So this was our ne negation client, and this is the synchronous version, where I'm selecting, sending, receiving, and selecting. And remember, select is also a sending operation. So if I if I were asynchronous, I could also uh, I could also bunch all the set, uh, all the send operation uh, in, in one, uh, and that could even be more efficient uh, because I could 
just send that all in one message and then let the receiver deal with that. Whereas here, um, I have um, basically I'm assuming that this is one message, this is one network message, and this is as well. Now, whereas here, I could just bunch it all together and send it in one. Okay? And now, um, um, this asynchronous client has a, a different type. Yeah? So essentially, this receiving and this sending operations are, are exchanged. And that's not a super type of the, of the dual of the server type. Yeah? So it doesn't fit into the theory so far. But there is also a theory about the synchronous super types, which uh, has gained some popularity recently. Um, there's, of course, a catch. The catch is synchronous subtyping is decidable, but asynchronous subtyping in general is undecidable. Uh, and if you're interested, then you can read all about that, and I won't go into that right here. Now, so if you don't put some restrictions on this asynchronous subtyping, then uh, then you're out of luck and everything is undecidable. All right. Let me so. Um, let me go to my favorite one, which is, we, we heard about dependent types, so you're probably interested in that. Um, so many practical protocols um, have some phenomenon which, uh, which I like to call variable length fields. Yeah, so um, which means that um, as part of the protocol, you first send the number of bytes or the number of fields that's to follow, and then you just send the fields. While you can encode that in, uh, in a session type, as we've seen them so far, this is really kind of um, mapping an array into a list. Uh, so the structure that you would use is something like this. So the type for sending bytes is an external choice between more and done. And then you send, uh, well, in this case, it receives one byte and then more bytes. Uh, so, and this is, uh, with that, you can send an arbitrary number of things, but it's quite inefficient. Uh, because uh, instead of just sending um, a stream of bytes, you're, you're always um, uh, receiving commands and then receiving another byte, so you kind of send twice as much um, stuff. Yeah? So you have intervening con flow control messages like more and done. And for that, um, it would, I mean, of course it would be more efficient to first just send a number and then just send a stream of bytes. So and that's a typical scenario for dependent types. Um, but for that, we need to write a type-level function, as uh, Edwin already, already told you, and then you need to write a dependently type function that actually receives the byte stream. Uh, so in, in the code that I'm showing you, as the final thing, um, uh, I'll just return a, a list, but of course you could return a vector or whatever. Uh, so firstly, you would need such, such a type-level function so that is a function from numbers to type. And uh, essentially, it creates a session type out of the number n. Yeah, so if the number is 0, then the session type is n. Otherwise, it's uh, receive one byte and then receive n minus one bytes. So it's a, second, it's a recursively defined function that expands to receive as many bytes as your argument tells you. And then you can write a function, so I think this is the interesting one, which takes a number and uh, then a channel of this b of n type and then returns a list of five. Uh, and there's really no magic in there, so the, the type here unfolds as the n unfolds. Yeah? So here you have, if n is zero, then you know b of n is n, and you just return the empty list. Otherwise, um, the type is ready to, the, the channel is ready to, um, um, to receive one, uh, one byte. And then we recursively read the remaining n minus one bytes and put it back together. <coughs> well, and with that, you can really, I mean, so there's no overhead. Uh, yeah, so initially the number of bytes and then just the byte stream, uh, and that's all expressed in one typed protocol. All right. So what do you need here? Well, the types for sending and receiving need to um, uh, admit dependency. So it's not just restricted to function types, but also to these send and receive types. In order to deal with it, you need to uh, have these pi and sigma types, dependent products and sums. Uh, the challenge is that type checking and subtyping needs to be decidable. Uh, so of course, we don't want to give up the flexibility that I've just told you about. So you want some subtyping. 
and type level functions need to be terminating because otherwise this desirability is out of the door immediately. And that brings me to the end. Right, so um, I've I, hope, I have to give you a glimpse of uh, session types, which is a powerful uh, formalism to uh, model protocols. Um, and uh, it was initially conceived for uh, pi calculus and concurrent lambda calculus, but nowadays there are actually reasonable implementations in uh, a, a range of languages. So there are implementations for <laughs> Java, Scala, OCaml, Haskell, and other languages. Um, but I have to say, none of these has all the guarantees. So most of them get pretty far, but none of them actually enforces this linearity, which makes the whole thing um, safe. And it's also related to contracts and type state and so on, and there are many extensions. And if you're interested in, in, uh, in a, a wider picture, um, there is a nice book by Simon Gay and uh, Antonio Ravara, um, Behavioral Types from Theory to Tools, that was created as part of a uh, EU-sponsored cost action, which finished like two years ago. Well, thank you for your attention. to um, like uh, push this typing down to the bit level. Uh, so when where you have actually so, so these types are pretty abstract still and, and on a quite high level programmer level, but uh, it would be an interesting idea to push it down really to the system level where you can speak in the protocol about single bits. Uh, but that's as far as I know that's not be done. So I, I've built a lot of clients that serve in my life and uh, people actually embed a whole lot of safety information inside the messages. And the, my first impression is that that's sort of a perpendicular safety properties to the ones you're describing and, and it could be quite interesting. Yeah, that can be a good place. Yeah, I mean, usually you, you also want to have uh, some, you want to specify some behavior on timeouts or on other network errors and so on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are extensions for that, which I skipped over now. Um, but there's also a, a practical side that needs to be addressed on top of, of this, sure. Um, so when I want to send um, some number of bytes um, from server to client or the other way around, um, but <coughs> like so at first, it means that I need to send a sequence, sequence of zeros and ones, which is the number. Mm -hmm. um, of of a sequence, well, the the, the, the length of the sequence of zeros, zeros and ones, which I'm going to be sending uh, right afterwards. So it's like I'm sending a variable uh, sequence of zeros and ah. ones mm -hmm. about uh, a variable sequence of zeros and ones, of, well, fixed in this case. So ah, okay. it's, mm -hmm. it's like mm -hmm. chicken egg problem. Of so in, in this case, the assumption is that, that the numbers are encoded as a fixed size uh, okay. 32, 64 bits. Like otherwise, you would be in exactly the problem that you're describing. That's good. Thank you. Yeah. We have time for one more question. In some sense, the, the so so firstly, this is for simplicity, but you can also deploy that approach in a distributed setting, and then you would need some central registry that that kind of tells you what is the session type that needs to run on this on this channel, and then you need to make the connection through the reference through through that. 
uh, I mean, of course, at every endpoint, you can only check against the, the type you're given. You know? So you can only say, I, I check my code against the server type, and the other one checks the code against the client type. Um, so you have to trust this registry that it gives you the right type for the connection. Yeah, so you need some mediator in, in case things are not in the same process. I agree with that. Uh, okay, so you didn't. So, um, uh, so there, there are extensions to to the formalism uh, that deals with some of the aspects, but uh, apart from that, you still need to implement some network layer that that deals with uh, timeouts, exceptions, and stuff like that. So, thank you very much. One more.